Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to our 2021 annual luncheon as we're having to do it virtually this year. We're hoping this will be our final event where it will be completely virtual. Uh, we appreciate everyone for being a part of this and joining in. I know we're going to have a few people uh, signing on in the next few minutes. Uh, we've got a full event today packed with great information, some fantastic speakers. Uh, looking forward to hearing from all of them, but wanted to just do a little bit of a rundown for OICA. Uh, over the last year, we've certainly had to adapt and adjust just like the rest of society. And it, it has been difficult, but I feel like we have managed to do the best we can to be advocates for children, working with lawmakers and policy uh, uh, options through different agencies to ensure that kids are still well represented with having a voice at the Capitol and within government. Uh, we've been very active at the federal level this year, working with uh, congressmen like Mark Wayne Mullen, as you heard, for those of you that attended our last uh, advocacy chat, uh, working on foster youth issues. And it was fantastic to see success come about through uh, Chafee funding and those dollars coming down to the state to assist with different issues that will happen with the foster youth of Oklahoma. Uh, as you are well aware, we're in the middle of the legislative session right now and we're going to kick over in a few minutes and hear from one of uh, our capital crew to talk about uh, what's going on with that. But first, uh, we certainly need to give thanks to our sponsors. And we have some wonderful sponsors that are helping out today. Uh, first, I wanna recognize Clay Franklin, the plan president and CEO of Oklahoma Complete Health. Clay is a lifelong Oklahoman and committed to uh, yes. uh, the local medical community uh, he's passionate about improving Oklahoma's health and access to high quality health care and takes the unique needs of our communities into account to develop programs that are overcome with barriers to care. So it's my pleasure to introduce Clay Franklin. Thank you very much for the introduction and um, hello everybody. Nice to meet you um, virtually. My name is Clay Franklin. I'm the president and CEO of Oklahoma Complete Health and we're thrilled to be supporting the Oklahoma Institute of Child Advocacy and your organization or policies that really advocate to helping protect our children and focus on children, which really is aligned with um, our purpose, our mission of Oklahoma Complete Health, that we transform the lives of members of our community one life at a time. You know, having been raised right here in Oklahoma, native Oklahoman, and um, raised by a, a, a group of school uh, teachers and educators around me, there's always been a focus on, um, on children and for advocacy, for education. And um, uh, I'm actually participating later this month in helping them prevent um, um, child abuse and, and for an event to do that. So I've been raised to very much focus on, on, on our children, knowing that it's the future of investment of what we do. And I'm thrilled and just happy to be here um, representing Oklahoma Complete Health and Mr. Schultz. Thank you for the introduction and I'll hand it back over to you. Clay, we certainly appreciate the partnership and working with you and we're thankful for all that you're doing for Oklahoma. And so thank you for helping us out today and thank you for being a part of the solutions of what we're looking for here in Oklahoma. Thank you, sir. And now it's my pleasure to uh, turn the mic over to one of our, our team members. Uh, I've known Haley Falkenberry for years, uh, going back to our days in politics and now we both saw the light and moved on to advocacy work. Uh, Haley is uh, basically our lead at the state capitol, working on issues for the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy and helping make sure that those policies that we create through the fall forum and the legislative agenda that we shape is brought to reality through the bills passed by the senators and representatives. And so now I wanna turn it over to Haley to give a quick update about the session. Uh, Please don't tune over. Uh, the House is still in session right now. Uh, our conversation is going to be uh, much better and probably uh, less stress on, on your blood pressure. So stick around, Haley, it's all yours. <laughs> oh, thanks, Joe. First of all, can everybody hear me? I always like to check that before I get rattling off. Um, it's always wonderful to get to be on these. You're gonna hear a little bit about where we are on some of our priorities that we've talked about a few times. Uh, let's start off with House Bill 1709, which is actually a bill that you've heard me talk about several times this session, 
We are super excited about this legislation. It's by Representative Brian Hill and Senator Racino. What it does is it amends the Oklahoma Successful Adulthood Act by allowing services to continue to the age of 21 as long as the youth is in an out of home placement at the time of their 16th birthday. So you guys have heard us talk a lot about we've run into instances where a youth might be in a trial reunification or, you know, just kind of getting back into the swing of things and being back home whenever they are like 17 and a half or 17. Something happens and the youth is displaced once they turn 18 and they don't qualify for those services because they weren't in that out of home placement. So this is something that we've heard from you guys out in the field that was a real life problem going on for these youth. And we're getting very close to actually getting this one done. So it actually passed the House. It's passed the Senate. The Senate added an emergency to the bill to make sure that we are capturing some of the funds that are coming down from the feds. Joe mentioned just a little bit ago about all of the efforts that this has gone into that deal with our chafee efforts and how the federal government is making sure that these youth are getting some extra funds uh, due to the COVID pandemic. So we are adding an emergency to that. Shout out to Senator Racino for getting that done. And it is headed back over to the House for acceptance of amendments. So when I say acceptance of amendments, it's only that emergency. We do not foresee any issues with this bill and hopefully I'll be reporting back that this bill is actually law pretty soon. So very excited. Thank you to multiple partners of OICA for working very closely with us on this bill that will uh, be tremendous for our youth transitioning out of foster care. Another bill that I wanna mention is House Bill 1799. It's actually by Representative Miller and Senator Racino again. Um, what it does is it actually permits legal guardians of children with juvenile court records to request expungement, or if a youth turns 18, they can actually request that expungement as well. So obviously we support anything that we can to make sure that those that have you know, gone through any issues with our legal system can move forward and be successful whenever they are no longer involved with those systems. So we're really, really excited about this one. It's something we worked on with the bill authors as well as our friends over at the, um, the Office of Juvenile Affairs. So very excited about that one. Another one that you guys have heard me talk a million times about, again, I'm very excited about a lot of things this year, if you can't tell, but um, this one definitely goes in that category, House Bill 1773 by Representative Conley and uh, Senator Garvin. And what it does is it actually requires the study of multi-tiered systems of support for uh, individuals that are in pre-service uh, teacher prep programs. So we all know in the state of Oklahoma, we have very high incidence of ACEs, our adverse childhood experiences. And it's very important that our teachers understand how to work around those behavioral issues that we're seeing in the classroom, that we're not looking at methods like suspension and things like that, since uh, we have all of those problems in the classroom with those youth. So this is a very positive bill. It's something that I know multiple of you, uh, multiple individuals on this call have actually talked to Representative Conley, Senator Garvin about. They are very passionate about this program moving forward and we are very happy with what's going on with that. And that one is actually signed by the governor as well. So we're getting to talk about some successes today. I do wanna shift and talk about one bill that we're still a little concerned with there were multiple pieces of legislation, number one, that were filed this session that would make it more difficult for um, individuals to be vaccinated, allowing for barriers to be put in place. I do wanna say we're down to one bill that we would put in that category. It's the bill I'm gonna talk about today. So I just don't want anybody to feel like we haven't seen a lot of success just because we're talking about this bill. Definitely want to um, thank all of our partners that have worked very hard to get rid of some of the legislation that was not positive this year. But do you want to mention that Senate Bill 658 by uh, Representative West and Senator Standridge is still moving through the process. A lot of you guys have expressed your concerns on that bill. What it would do is it would require the Department of Education and school districts to provide information on exemptions and any notice or publication regarding immunization requests. The bill has also been amended while it was over in the House to actually put guidelines in place that would create barriers for schools who are wanting to uh, implement mask mandates, which we find alarming due to some of the worry that we have 
moving forward as we're going through this pandemic, making sure that things that have protected individuals are not lifted too early in the process. So I know we have a video that we're even going to share that's in line with some of the reasons that we're a little worried about Senate Bill 658. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have about any of these bills, or also I know that Lacey and Miranda are set to also kind of show a video about where we are on some of these issues. Thank you, Haley. And yes, uh, we'll go ahead and kick over and watch that video. If anyone has any questions, please type them in the chat section and we can answer those throughout the conversation if need be. And Haley, we certainly appreciate everything you do for us out there, but I hope everyone enjoys this video. Hi, my name is Miller and I'm battling leukemia. There are a lot of kids in Oklahoma just like me that are at risk of COVID-19. Many medical conditions put us more at risk. We need your help. For us to be safe at school and church, we need the adults around us to mask up and get vaccinated. We need 70% of Oklahomans to get their shots. Please also consider donating blood to save our lives. For more information, go to maskok.org. I hope everyone enjoyed that. That was one of the great things that we've been able to do with OICA this year to partner with those collaborative organizations at the end of that video to put together uh, this opportunity to raise awareness. Um, um, our star of that commercial is Miller, who is the son of one of our staff members and the ordeal that they've gone through. Uh, we've witnessed firsthand as a family here at OICA and certainly keep them in prayers. Miller is doing much better, but the fact remains, he and a lot of kids out there like him need adults to do just what he said, mask up, get your vaccination, and donate blood. One of our partners, Oklahoma Blood Institute, is working on legislation at the Capitol also uh, to promote incentives for business to uh, encourage uh, daytime blood drives during work hours. And so that's one of the bills that's on our periphery we've been uh, assisting with and what Haley touched on is just a fraction of the work we're doing, but some of the most important we felt you needed to know about and hear about. Uh, we're always here to be responsive to any of the questions and comments that you have and to try and work on these issues for kids. We've been around since 1983 and continuing the fight. In fact, one of our board members is sitting here in the office with me, uh, Laura Choate, who is one of the reasons we have the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy. And so, we're going to continue to be that voice for Oklahoma's children. And we couldn't do this without our sponsors. And we have another sponsor we want to thank. And it's always a pleasure to have one of our board members speak as well. Uh, former Senator A.J. Griffin and I had the chance to serve together and work on a lot of issues together. And having the opportunity to continue that after our terms in the legislature, or our sentences in the legislature, as some people would look at it, uh, it's been great to have the chance to work on these issues and with her employer and the work that Paycom does in Oklahoma, they have been tremendous sponsors of our work. And so AJ, I want to kick it over to you and thank you very much for everything you've done for OICA. Well, thanks, Joe. And it's good to be here with you guys today as one fellow escapee to another. <laughs> we escaped the legislature and today I'm really glad I've escaped and I don't have to watch what's happening in the House. Um, just on behalf of Paycom, um, our 35,000 business clients across the, the country, including over 3,000 nonprofits that we partner with providing HR technology, um, we're excited to, to sponsor this event. And a big thank you to all of you that work hard for, for children um, across the, the state of Oklahoma. Also, do you want to give a little plug? If you are not familiar with our CEO's foundation, the Green Shoe Foundation, um, I, I, I encourage you to check that out, um, offering mental health supports to adults through an, an intensive um, workshop uh, that allows adults an opportunity to address their past trauma as children. So I just want to make sure that you're aware of the Green Shoe Foundation as well. So it's good to be with you today. Looking forward to the program. Uh, thank you very much. And also, thank you. Uh, I mentioned AJ is a board member. Laura is sitting here as a board member. We have a lot of our board members on here. Uh, we as the staff at OICA couldn't do this work without our board of directors. So thank you to each of you for the dedication for children and the time that you put in. We know we pull a lot of hours in your 
schedule to do the work that we do. And we, we certainly appreciate, we have 24 board members active and working right now. And so we're right there at the max number of what we're allowed to have as far as board members. And we're thankful so many Oklahomans want to be a part of that. And part of the work that we do has changed through the years. Uh, Ann Roberts, I know is on the call and Ann, I, I refer to her as my spirit animal. Ann was the executive director here for 20 years. And she's certainly helped me in the early days of when I had this job, uh, keeping things going and through the years of being a, a sounding board. And she and I've talked about the needs for kids, not just the work we do at the Capitol, not just the legislation, not just the work with agencies, but making sure we have the best opportunities for all children. And when I applied for this job, the board and I discussed options of what we could do to raise awareness about the good work that kids are doing for their peers. Uh, the things that Oklahoma's youth are doing to improve the lives of people around them. And with that, we partnered with Sunbeam Family Services a few years ago to create the Kid Governor Competition. And Sunbeam, as they transitioned into other work, uh, they allowed us to take over the Kid Governor position completely and run it ourselves just this last year. And so the first Kid Governor we've had that has been solely working with OICA and I believe is our fourth kid governor, uh, Ms. Charlotte Anderson is joining us. Charlotte and I had the opportunity to go to the state capitol this morning and meet some of the folks that she looks up to and is uh, looking forward to working with on her agenda. She has a platform just like any other governor would. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you the kid governor of the great state of Oklahoma, Charlotte Anderson. Thank you. Hello, I am Charlotte Anderson, the kid governor of Oklahoma. At the Oklahoma City Bombing Memorial, Governor Stitt said, it's okay to disagree on the details and still be friends. I hope you will remember that today as they talk about things that matter to me as kid governor. I want to cover a few topics today involving health. The health of kids is not good for the state of Oklahoma. Neither is anything else, if I'm being honest but health is the worst. In my campaign speech, I mentioned that Oklahoma ranks 49th out of 50 states for the health of kids. What does that mean? I decided to do research on what it means to have kids with bad health. What I found was that the study included a few things in deciding we were 49th. Low birth weight babies, no health insurance, kids dying, and kids being overweight or, or obese or not being healthy and fit. The first three things us kids can't control. You guys have all the power over taking care of moms so babies are born healthy, making sure we kids can see doctors and get medicine, and keeping us safe. I need you to work on those things. The last thing, kids being healthy and needing to be healthy and fit, is what I wanna focus on today. That's because we kids can have some control over our health, but that doesn't mean I'm letting you off the hook. First, you should make sure kids can get healthy foods in their schools, neighborhoods, and homes. Eating impacts kids' health. Kids need vegetables and fruit. Last year, I asked my family and my church to do a vegan challenge for the month of May, where we ate one vegan meal every day. I called it Earth May because eating less meat and dairy helps erase your carbon footprint. It's also healthy. My sister didn't really participate, but that's because she was only three and she loves hot dogs. When I did the vegan challenge, I learned that I loved salads and it made my body feel healthy. I'm doing it again this year. Second, kids need to move. Adults, your children and teens are always watching what you do. They see how you handle stress, they watch how you treat other people and observe how you deal with your feelings. They soak in all that information like little sponges. Even when you think your children aren't paying attention, it's essential to be a positive role model. You are not setting a good example for us kids. We not only watch you, we try to be like you because we think you know more than you actually do. Adults, turn off all the screens and get outside. Bring your kids too. Because of the pandemic, kids are not having recess like they used to, and some kids aren't playing sports like they used to. Activity is good for kids' health. 
could, and their mental health. I read an article in the paper about Senate Bill 2. You grown-ups are supposed to be good and helping kids. Instead of encouraging kids to play sports, you are and be active. The legislator is keeping some girls from playing sports. That seems mean. I want you to be helping kids play sports. Have you ever asked kids what they think about laws? Because when I read the article in the paper, it didn't sound like kids had a choice. If you ask kids, they would say Senate Bill 2 is bad because we don't care what's in each other's underwear when we are playing, and neither should you. I watched the women's and men's basketball tournaments in March. The women's weight room only had a little stack of weights compared to the men's, which had bench weights and tons of good equipment. I thought that was not fair. If we want girls to play sports, we need to be giving the same amount of money to girls' sports as we give to boys' sports, not telling some girls they can't play. Making sure kids get their activity in is essential. Making it more fun helps. Sports are not the only way to stay active. Kids should spend at least an hour a day outside. You may not know how to be active, so I will tell you how I stay active. I play tennis with my grandfather every Sunday, but with this splint, I'm taking a break. But that doesn't mean I'm not staying active. I can still do jumping jacks and ballet and walk with my dogs. One thing I love to do is go to parks with my family. We take sidewalk chalk. My brother once stuffed his pockets with like 20 pieces of chalk. We split up and one group writes codes using pig pen ciphers, writing backwards and scrambling words to give directions to the other group. The other group tries to follow the directions like we are on a secret mission. Another thing we do, and my parents don't think this is a good idea, but my brother and my sister and I run laps around the house. We say we are running away from snorkel dorks. What is a snorkel dork? Well, they are everywhere. Use your imagination. They're behind curtains. They're sitting at the table. They are on the couch. The only way to beat a snorkel dork is to run at it at full speed. I made a bingo card of more of my ideas for outdoor activities for kids. You should print it off and try to check off every box. The pandemic has also really affected kids' mental health. Kids are not able to see their friends every day to talk about their feelings. That social interaction is important for kids' mental health and mental growth. With the pandemic, I felt lots of anger and sadness. It helps when I punch a pillow. Doing animal breaths also helps, which is two breaths in and one breath out. Kids need to know that their feelings are healthy and that there are safe ways to show their emotions. Grown-ups, you have a lot of work to do. I promise I will stay active and encourage other kids to stay active. Will you promise to be active, get kids to be active, and fight for the health of kids? Also, will you talk to kids and ask their opinions? We may not get to vote, but we still matter. And one day we will be in charge of your health when you're old. Just saying. Now, it is my honor to introduce the next speaker, a new friend of mine. Matt Pinnell is the 17th Lieutenant Governor of the state of Oklahoma. In that role, he serves as the President of the Oklahoma State Senate and is a member of, the, of multiple boards and commissions. Lieutenant Governor Pinnell is all, also serves as Secretary of Tourism wildlife and heritage. Lieutenant Governor Pinnell is a graduate of Oral Roberts University. He lives in Tulsa with his wife and their four children. I met him this morning at the Capitol and learned that we both like to play tennis. Charlotte, uh, I think I can speak for the rest of those listening and watching right now. You are a star. Uh, a round of applause. <clears throat> You are an absolute star uh, and you're just getting started. And I am totally fine with you being in charge of my healthcare when I am old. Uh, I, I want you to be in charge. If you're in charge, Oklahoma is going to be uh, in a much better place. Uh, so thank you so much for that introduction uh, and, and for those comments, because I can tell you, Charlotte, I'm all in. I'm all in on making sure that we are creating a better state for you, for the next generation particularly when it comes to health outcomes. 
and living healthier and, and having a more active uh, lifestyle uh, for our next generations. And I want you to, to see that elected officials inside of this building and across the state of Oklahoma, mayors and city managers are investing uh, in your health and wanting you to be, being, be able to live uh, healthier lifestyles as well. Uh, and that's one of the things that certainly I wanna be talking about uh, today. Uh, so to uh, the Oklahoma Institute uh, for Child Advocacy and, and all the work that you do, uh, I, uh, Joe, thank you for, for the invitation uh, to, to address you all today. Uh, and, and I want to speak to, again, this, this issue of childhood obesity uh, and, and just healthy living and a healthy kid initiative in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, this is something that uh, we have needed for a while. Uh, thankfully, the, the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy has done a wonderful job over many decades of, of focusing on this issue. Uh, and we're hoping to now kind of take the baton and run with it. Uh, and, and it's one of the things that uh, I want to update you on uh, with at, in my office as Lieutenant Governor. It's something that we're focused on. A few of the statistics, and Charlotte mentioned a few of these, uh, and these are statistics that, that, that all of us uh, watching this know, but Oklahoma ranks eighth out of 50 states in childhood obesity. Uh, close to 20% of Oklahoma youths ages 10 to 17 uh, are in that obese range. Childhood obesity, as we all know, can lead to health issues into adulthood. Uh, any doctor will tell you that. Uh, and when we saw what, uh, through the, what we've all dealt with over the last year, year and a half in Oklahoma and around the world when it comes to those obesity rates uh, and how it affected COVID, uh, related patients as well was drastic. Uh, about 36.8% of Oklahoman adults uh, are considered in that obese range as well. So what we, what we learn, what, what we're taught, and, and, and those cultural divides, again, as youths, as we grow up, it turns into habits as adults. So Charlotte is right. Uh, we need to make sure that kids in this state know that we want and we will be investing in them when it comes to better health outcomes. And again, as, as I told Charlotte, and as I'm telling you right now, we're all in. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that I asked uh, to kind of be leading a new Healthy Kid campaign in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, this has not been announced yet publicly. So, you know, you're hearing, you're hearing it here first. Uh, but we have had our first meeting. Uh, and, and Joe and I were actually just talking about this, how pleased we were uh, with the turnout. Uh, over 20, gosh, I, I'd say close to 30 different agencies and nonprofits in the state. There were a number of, of folks uh, that, that said, hey, we need to make sure that we have this, in, this individual or this agency or this nonprofit at our next meeting, which was the perfect feedback. That's the kind of feedback that I wanted. It, listen, I've got four kids in the public school system. I'm raising four kids in Oklahoma. I'm not an expert. Uh, but I'm passionate about this issue. I want to get the experts around me uh, that, that, that are in this arena every single day working, on, working with children on a number of issues, but when it, when it comes to health outcomes. And I really think that's what we did with our first meeting. Uh, we don't know exactly what this campaign is going to be called. Again, Charlotte, I'm sure, probably has a lot of better ideas than I do as far as what we need to be calling a campaign like this because we need to reach kids where kids are. Uh, and, and, I, and I want you to hear that for me and where my heart is on this. I, I am not creating a healthy, you know, relaunching a healthy kid campaign in the state of Oklahoma uh, to just go through the motions, you know, check a box that, that we created another, uh, another campaign in the state of Oklahoma. That's the last thing a state government needs or a bureaucracy needs is just creating another program uh, that does not have teeth to it or money behind it. Uh, or the right individuals behind it as well. Uh, and I want to be held accountable to that standard. And I, and I know I will uh, with the 25 to 30 agencies, uh, and again, nonprofits, that, that, uh, when, when we had that first meeting. Uh, and so that really is the goal uh, that, that I have, again, as your Lieutenant Governor, and again, who will be chairing uh, this, this Healthy Kid Initiative, um, that that's the goal that I have uh, with with, you know, I'm just a dad. <laughs> At the end of the day, I'm a dad. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely honored to serve as your lieutenant governor, but I'm just a dad raising four kids, uh, my wife and I, uh, and wanting to raise our kids in a state that they can be proud of. 
uh, and, and I think the Charlottes of the world are going to be a whole lot more proud of their state when they see their politicians investing in them. Uh, and not just empty talk and empty rhetoric, because the next generations can sniff fake coming a long way away. They know when it's just a politician uh, saying something or patting them on the head and saying, hey, you're up to bat next. Uh, Charlotte, you don't vote, but you have more influence than you think you do. Uh, I want you to know that. Uh, the influence that you have, that your generation has, uh, you may not be going to that ballot box, uh, but uh, the power in numbers, again, when it comes to our generations, younger generations that want to make a difference in the state that, again, I hope you want to grow up in uh, and raise your own family in, that's what I'm all in on. Uh, and so this Healthy Kid Initiative, uh, again, along with the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy, I'm extremely excited about uh, for us to be a top 10 state. And please hear me on this. Uh, we can go out, we can create a bunch of jobs, we can fix roads and bridges, we can invest in our public education system. Of course, we need to be doing those things. But if we are not investing in a generation when it comes to healthy living and healthy, healthy lifestyles, then a lot of those things aren't going to be effective. Uh, we've got to do the blocking and tackling first. We got to do the small things well to turn into big things. Uh, and that is making sure that we are living a much healthier lifestyle both with, our, with, with, chi with children in this state and adults. Uh, and so there will be a whole lot more information to come uh, on, uh, again, our Healthy Kid Initiative that we will be relaunching. Those of you all that are watching right now, uh, if you would like to be a part of this, please reach out to, again, my Lieutenant Governor office. Uh, everyone that wants to have a voice is gonna have a voice in this. Republican, Democrat, Independent. Uh, I want everyone at the, at the, seat, of at the seat of that table. Uh, I lead that way as your lieutenant governor. Uh, these issues should not be partisan. Uh, and I always appreciate, again, the way that, that Joe and, again, his, his leadership and his team uh, and the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy always uh, has operated that way. Uh, the issues, not just when we're talking about childhood obesity, but all the different issues uh, that the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy advocates for on behalf of children uh, should not be partisan issues. Uh, and the things that Charlotte talked about. Uh, those are Oklahoma issues. Uh, and for Oklahoma, again, to be the kind of state that Charlotte wants, the kind of state that I want, uh, and the, sta the state that I know everyone uh, watching today wants, those are issues that we should rally behind, get behind, and make sure that we can, again, be a top 10 state and start uh, winning deals uh, and, and, and creating more jobs in the state. I think if we do, again, the things that we've just been talking about here in the few short minutes, those things are going to make just as big of a difference uh, as a road or a bridge or some of these other uh, things that we talk about inside of this state capitol. So it's a real, again, an honor for me. I, I really uh, am very thankful uh, that you would invite me to, uh, to, to again, speak to uh, your awards banquet. I hope that we are in person um, in the future. Uh, again, also very thankful for uh, our vaccination rates and, and what we've been able to do on the front end here to make sure we're getting as many people vaccinated as possible in the state of Oklahoma so that we can open up and people feel more comfortable getting out. Uh, I assure you I am pushing that as much as possible. Uh, I would get five shots in my arm right now if that meant uh, that it was going to help more people get vaccinated in the state. I see Keith Reed. I, oh, they, yeah, there's Keith right there. A round of applause for Keith Reed, my gosh. Uh, Keith probably didn't know I was gonna give him a shout out, uh, but I see your, your face, Keith. So uh, what he has been, and, and you talk about a tireless effort. Um, I, I, some, certainly um, uh, has done uh, just, just an amazing job of making sure uh, that access to vaccinations across 77 counties uh, is something that is, is a priority for us. But as we kind of turn that corner and get outside, again, healthy living, uh, both indoors or outdoors, we got a long way to go. As Charlotte said, we've got a long way to go to get off the bad lists and onto a good list when it comes to healthy living. Uh, and it's been a priority for me and my family and our kids. And I look forward to talking about uh, this Healthy Kid campaign as we move into the future. So on behalf of the, my Lieutenant Governor office, my doors are always open to everybody that I'm looking at right now, uh, at, at either via Zoom or in person into the future. Uh, and I look forward to creating a much healthier 
world. And again, that starts with, with us, with our own families right here in our backyards, right here in Oklahoma. So thank you for giving me a few minutes. God bless you all and God bless the state of Oklahoma. Governor, I want to say thank you very much. And for those on the call, if you don't know, you always refer to someone by the highest total t uh, title they've held. And when Governor Stitt is out of state, we have Governor Pinnell. So you are our governor as well. And we really appreciate everything you're doing on this. We appreciate the cabinet taking this up, um, the Kevin Stitt administration looking at this. And we certainly appreciate your vision and the expertise you're going to put into this. We know we're going to see solutions because of this. And just wanted to open it up uh, between you and Charlotte, if y'all want to talk about some of these things about what y'all feel would be ways that we can go forward and Ann touched on a, a perfect bill that OICA and other organizations have been working on to improve uh, information about health being out there. What, what do the two of you see as ways that advocates on the call and others can join in this mission? Charlotte, Charlotte I'll let you start. Um, encourage kids they know and get other kids to be active and because that affects mental health, mental growth, everything in health. Then That's we, good. You know, uh, Joe, as we kind of talked about in that <clears throat> in our initial meeting, when it comes to, as Charlotte said, en encouraging kids to live these, these healthier lifestyles. It was amazing for me to hear, and again, this was a good thing, when I, when I had this meeting, to hear what the Department of Health was doing, uh, to hear what the Department of Education was already doing, to hear what the Department of Ag, these, these uh, Ag ambassadors that go out in the schools. You know, I remember cutting her off mid-sentence. I said, okay, we have health ambassadors in the Department of Ag. Let's utilize health ambassadors in the Department of Ag. So uh, it, it's not all about schools. But yes, that's a big part of it. Um, but you know, you got a lot of, of kiddos going home after school, and a mom and her dad are, are not home. Uh, a grandma, or, a grandma, or grandma, a grandpa or grandma is not home either. So we we've got to realize uh, these seven hundred thousand plus kids just in our public school system. Um, it, you know, they're not they're not eating a home cooked meal, uh, br breakfast, uh, noon or or dinner. Uh, and we've got to make sure we are, we're meeting kids where they're at. Um, you know, this was something certainly that I saw, you know, when, when uh, our family, we, we've been uh, foster parents for a number of years. We're not doing it right now uh, because I'm a, I, I, unlike AJ, I'm not smart enough to, to know that maybe I shouldn't be a politician sometimes. Uh, I travel too much. But, it, you know, to see what, what again, kids in this state uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and then we're inside this capital. Uh, doing silly stuff, unfortunately, uh, not addressing some of those issues, um, it drives me crazy. Uh, and, and so to Charlotte's point, we got to be listening to kids. We got to meet kids where they're at. But it was very uh, encouraging, Joe, what I would say it was very encouraging to hear the Department of Health gets it, Department of Education, they understand those issues because they're, they're in those foxholes every single day dealing with them. But we got to make sure that uh, we we get we get rid of silos. You know, silos is the the the, the number one word that I've heard inside of state government in, in the first couple of years in office is the word silo. You know, all these they, everyone has their own little silos and their own little fiefdoms, and 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 they don't work together. Uh, and I will give uh, uh, Governor Stitt some credit on that, and and our executive branch and a lot of our cabinet that listen. Let's try to be one Oklahoma. Let's try to work together. Let's do uh, work, work together agency to agency. I'd like to see that. I want to see more of it. Uh, but for, for to have a healthy kid campaign and a holistic, a holistic campaign, it's going to take all of these agencies kind of working together, not Department of Ag over here doing their thing and education over here. It's got to be one campaign um, and, and simplified uh, to, to Charlotte's point. Can I go to the meetings? Oh, of course. Yes. You better believe it. I'll even let you vote in there, Charlotte. You don't think you got to vote? You got to vote. I'll, I'll put you in there. Yeah. I'll get you the, uh, I'll get you the list. We, we don't have the next, the next meeting's not on our calendar yet, Charlotte, but we'll get that to you. Thank you.
And Charlotte's definitely going to be a dynamic voice. So Charlotte, I know you put together a bingo game and you mentioned in your speech. Could you uh, could you tell people about what your bingo game is? Just healthy habits for kids and uh, to try to check off every box and it will help get kids active. It's one of my fun ideas to get kids active. I also have a scavenger hunt, but it's not all the way done. Well, once it is done, we will put both of those, the bingo card and the scavenger hunt up on our, your Facebook page. OICA runs a Kid Governor of Oklahoma Facebook page. So uh, you can go to the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy Facebook page or our website at OICA.org. And we will have those up for people to see. And we certainly want to encourage that. And I know that falls right in line with some of the ideas that the Lieutenant Governor has had and has said in those meetings. I'm very optimistic. Uh, Matt threw a Keith Reed under the bus a second ago. I'm going to do the same thing. Keith is one of our leaders over there at the health department who is making things happen. And uh, we appreciate everything that they're doing right now in a pandemic, in and out of the pandemic to make sure Oklahomans are healthier. And so it's gonna be fun to have this team working together and worked to put together the Fit Gids Coalition years ago and drive a lot of the legislative agenda at the Capitol. And so it's nice to see things from that time period continuing to this day and hopefully building on those many successes and shepherd through the Capitol. Well, and and Joe, that is a good point, it's specific to legislation. You know, this, this Healthy Kid campaign that we'll be launching, whether it's we just take the Fit Kid, you know, title or not, um, there is a legislative component to this. So if there's model legislation, best practice legislation in other states that we should be modeling here in Oklahoma, that's part of what we're looking for too. Uh, and, and so those of you all that have ideas on, on uh, uh, model legislation, and again, I know we, we do have those ideas. We, we, want, uh, we want those ideas and we wanna run those through the legislative process. And I, I know the vision of our two governors on this call and the partners like uh, Clay and AJ and their companies, I know we're going to see a lot of good things come about in the state. That's what makes me so optimistic and hopeful is we have young dynamic leaders in the state who are wanting to see some of these changes happen. And we certainly appreciate both of you uh, for your respective roles and what you're doing to make that happen. And I'm confident we're going to see much better come about for Oklahomans. I, I wanna leave it uh, closing remarks um, from both of you, if there's anything we didn't touch on. Uh, it's always that dreaded question journalists ask the politicians, is there anything we didn't mention that you would like to say? Um, uh, Governor Pinnell, we'll let you go and then we'll let Governor Anderson go. I, I love it, Governor Anderson. You like that, Charlotte, Governor Anderson? I bet you do. Um, I, you know, it, just again, thank you. Uh, to, to everyone uh, that, that is a supporter, uh, again, of the Oklahoma Institute of Child Advocacy. I, I see David on here. I mean, there's a lot of, from a policy uh, positions to those that, that are uh, in the trenches every single day, and I know you are, and I know it's hard work, uh, and sometimes you don't feel like you're rewarded for it. I want you to know you're seen. Uh, we, we absolutely appreciate it. Uh, I know uh, my kids do. Uh, and I do as your Lieutenant Governor. So I, I just wanna thank you for, for the work that you do. Uh, it, it's some of the most important work uh, that we can be doing as Oklahomans. And, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you uh, with this Healthy Kid campaign moving forward in the state of Oklahoma. Charlotte? Again, you grownups have a lot of work to do. <laughs> you might wanna start right now. Amen. And I can tell you it started with the, the group that the Lieutenant Governor put together and I'm confident that through your administration, uh, we're going to make some good things happen for kids and we thank you for being such a strong spokesperson and the willingness you have to serve and that, that goes especially for you too, Lieutenant Governor Pinnell. I know, and AJ can attest, the work that you do at the Capitol, you lose a lot of time and hours with your family and your personal life the sacrifices you make don't go unrecognized. We appreciate your leadership and your vision, and we are looking forward to working with you for many years to come. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. And we want to make sure that we delve into some of the science 
of this topic and we have not had the opportunity to officially work with our next speaker and I was thrilled when he was able to make it happen with his uh, schedule and the opportunity to join in on this effort. Uh, Dr. Chan Hellman is one of the foremost leaders in the area of this topic and we are so thrilled to have him today and so I wanted to read a little bit of his bio so you know the quality of the work of this next speaker. Uh, Dr. Shan Helm is a professor of social work at the University of Oklahoma and director of the Hope Research Center. He has written more than 150 scientific publications and has presented at numerous national and international conferences worldwide. Chan will present on his work uh, on hope with a TEDx in the spring of 2021. Chan's research is focused on hope as a psychological strength, helping children and adults overcome trauma and adversity. This research informed the development of the Hope-Centered and Trauma-Informed Training Program. Chan is a co-author of the award-winning book, Hope Rising, How the Science of Hope Can Change Your Life, with his co-author, Casey Gwynn, published by Morgan James. And as I said, I cannot tell you how thrilled that we are to have Chan with us today and speaking on this topic. Thank you for finding time in your schedule, and I want to turn it over to Chan right now. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to do a brief uh, kind of introduction to this uh, Science of Hope. I do want to um, say what an honor uh, it, it is to be uh, a speaker on the panel with uh, two amazing governors um, and, and certainly the, uh, the speaker after me. I'm going to get through as quickly as I can so I can hear uh, the, the follow-up speaker, Mr. Mr. Thomas. Um, I've also been involved in uh, uh, various studies with the health department uh, on childhood obesity. And the conversation that I wanna have today is really begin to think about uh, this language or this idea and the science of hope as a potential um, uh, overarching uh, framework that provides a common language across these various silos that uh, uh, Governor Pinnell uh, discussed that it provides this opportunity for a common language that creates a sort of a collective framework to begin to work together uh, on, these, on these issues. So real quickly, I'll go through um, a, a brief PowerPoint. Uh, I, I am a professor, um, so I have to have a PowerPoint. And I would also say that being asked to speak for less than three hours is fairly uncivilized, but I'll, I'll try to try to navigate through this uh, this adversity that is that is before me. So again, thank you for for that. Um, I will tell you that as I've been uh, evaluating uh, outcomes and impacts of programs uh, again on children and families, what I will tell you is that historically uh, we have been focused on using the question of what is wrong with individuals uh, with the basic framework that if we can reduce the adversity, that individuals are experiencing children, adults, and families, that that is historically how we treat well being. Um, that is, if we can reduce depression, anxiety, et cetera, uh, that those are the ways that we typically measure the success and outcomes of these types of programs. And so, what I wanna, wanna focus on is really shifting that conversation from the idea of potentially what is the adversity to really focusing on a more strengths-based focus of identifying these things that are, are right with individuals. Now, we all know that Oklahoma ranks really high in exposure to uh, childhood adversity uh, in the state of Oklahoma. And we know that that research uh, is really grounded into long-term outcomes such as obesity and other risk types of behaviors. Um, and so just for, from a framework of thinking about uh, that childhood adversity, Dr. Vince Folletti, one of the original authors of ACE, uh, endorses this idea of the science of hope uh, as a framework to begin to uh, move together at a more system level. So I'm gonna uh, maybe ask you to engage with me just a little bit. Uh, I only see about three or four faces on this Zoom call. so. Sometimes I fear that I'm speaking only to myself. So I'll just ask you to, uh, to engage just a little bit. And uh, just if you don't mind in the chat function for me, uh, can you go ahead and just uh, 
when you hear this word hope, what, what comes to mind? What does the word hope mean uh, for you? And I'll just wait for at least one or two of those to pop up. Maybe. I teach statistics, so I am used to silence. That's completely okay. Uh, great, wonderful, great, uh, great comments. Things will improve, joy, the future, great. Uh, Faith, thank you for that. Um, when you think about hope, is hope a way of thinking or is hope a feeling that we have? What is your thoughts on that? Is it a way of thinking or is it a feeling that individuals have? Okay, feeling, way of thinking, feeling, both, great. So what I want to tell you is that when we think about this word hope, when we think about this as a psychological uh, strength, as a coping resource, we treat it as a way of thinking. And the reason this is so important is because when we have the capacity to hope, we know it is something that can be taught. And so I now look at all of the programs that we evaluated through this lens of hope that these program services nurture uh, children, adults, and families hope so that they have the capacity to flourish. Hope is based upon three simple ideas, goals, pathways, and willpower. Uh, in particular, uh, goals become the cornerstone of our ability to hope. Um, the question becomes whether or not we have the ability to identify the pathways or the strategies by which to pursue those goals. And then finally, the willpower piece is really the motivation uh, or the mental energy that we have to dedicate towards those pathway pursuits. Um, I'll make this a little bit clearer in just a moment, uh, hopefully, but I begin to see things like program services, so uh, healthy kid initiatives, uh, these obesity programs, really as pathways of hope, uh, because these program services all have goals. Um, and the program services themselves are those pathways. And so my argument is that we use this language of hope as an organizing framework uh, by which to think about program services. So in order to be considered hopeful, you have to have both willpower and way power. You have to have both pathways thinking and uh, this uh, willpower. So it may be that I'm highly, uh, I have a lot of energy, I have a lot of desire for the goal, but I don't know how to get there from here. So we have a lot of desire for healthy kids in our communities, but what are those pathways? If we don't have those pathways, that would be considered lower in hope. Now, alternatively, we may have those pathways or programs, but if we're not motivated to engage in those program services, that is also lower hope. So what I'd like to highlight or ask you to do in the chat function is to think about when you use this word hope, uh, which we use every day in our everyday language. And it may be things like, I hope you have a great day. Uh, I hope you're well. I just got off a call with folks from California and I made the comment, I hope we have no tornadoes today. Um, but what I wanna be able to distinguish is really the difference between hoping and wishing because we often use the word hope when what we really mean is a wish. So when we're wishing for something, we have the willpower, we have the desire for the outcome, but we have no pathways. I have no control over the weather. So in that case, um, when we have a wish, it is passive towards the goals. When we have hope, it is about taking action to pursue those goals. So again, I tend to think about programs like the ones being discussed here as pathways of hope for our children, for our family, that these program services, these initiatives become pro uh, pathways towards the goal uh, of well-being for again, for, for our children. So why does this matter? What, is, what does it matter whether or not we think about hope in the context of these programs? And so this is what the science tells us uh, in the context of children in particular. So from a mental health perspective, uh, which uh, Governor Anderson discussed a little bit earlier, is that when we begin to nurture hope, we know that over 2000 published studies demonstrate that hope is the single best predictor of well-being 
of a child, of an adult, or a family's capacity to thrive, their ability to think about goals, pathways, and willpower. We also know uh, from physical health uh, that we have improved uh, health, higher compliance with treatment, improved health seeking, higher pain tolerance. Uh, it improves our social health, um, connectedness, improved positive relationships, uh, improved parent-child relationships. But more importantly, we know that if we can increase a child's hope score by two points, it predicts a letter grade change in the classroom. Um, that research is very consistent, that if we can move the needle on a child's capacity to think about the future differently than they are today, it improves these education outcomes. So uh, as I mentioned, hope is the single best predictor of well-being. So that is why I use it as a framework by which to begin to examine the way in which these program services are designed, that we do so with intention. So let me ask this question. I ask this in every presentation I give, uh, and I'd like for you to use the chat function, but what do you think is the opposite of hope? What is the opposite of hope? Again, just use that chat function. So, and I'll, I'll invite everybody to watch those words. Um, and despair is the most common uh, response. Uh, as a nurturing professor, what I will tell all of you is you're wrong, um, that the opposite of hope is actually despair, or I'm sorry, apathy. Uh, the opposite of hope is apathy. And when we're hopeless, it is when we look at the future goal and we realize there's no way we're going to be able to achieve it. So we just give up. Despair is still an important part of hope, but we understand the process of losing hope and how trauma and adversity influence that. So one of the things we've learned is that when children experience trauma and adversity, they tend to be focused more on avoidant goals than achievement goals. We know that it makes problem solving very difficult, uh, being able to find alternative pathways. Now, here's the part that uh, Governor Pinnell mentioned um, in this idea of the importance of our uh, education programs, of our community resources, because here's what we've learned in the research is that willpower is finite. Our mental energy is finite. There's only so much mental energy that we have to give. And more importantly, that research is showing that the glucose in our blood, the glucose in our system is associated with our willpower, with our motivation. So as we know, glucose for us is energy. So the idea then are these school lunch programs, these grab and go breakfasts, these programs in our communities that offer nutrition for children and families become such an important component of hope in, a, in our communities. The good news is, is that we know that we can teach hope. Our research shows that we can see a statistically significant increase in a child's hope scores in one hour or less with very intentional programs of goal setting and pathways development. We know how to do this process. And I believe that your program is a pathway of hope. We know how to set these goals and to find those viable pathways by which to achieve that. So again, for me, I think about hope as an overarching lens by which to see how to begin to implement these programs. And more importantly, what some of the important metrics would be to measure success. So just as a real quick example, and I'll wrap up, uh, this is a group, this is a brief intervention, non-therapeutic, a very hope-centered, set goals, find pathways, intervention. We actually trained 17, 18, and 19-year-old individuals to do the intervention for a high trauma group of, uh, of youth. And we measure hope before the intervention, after the intervention, and a 30-day follow-up. So we see a significant increase in these children hope scores. But what I wanna point out is again, this two point increase in hope from pre-test to post-test, while that is wonderful that we're able to nurture hope in children, 
this two point increase predicted a letter grade change in the classroom the final the following spring, almost a year later, uh, it improved educational outcomes. And for me, that is the importance and the power of hope. We know how to do this process. We know how to begin to integrate hope centered programs to nurture hope and well being in children and families. And so uh, final statement um, in this short uh, amount of time is to begin to think about the way things are right now in our lives. Where are we at right now as a state and a community? And the power of hope is when we can begin to imagine the way things could be, that we have a vision of the way things could be for our children and family. And for me, that is when hope uh, is born. So I'll stop sharing my slide. Um, and I didn't watch the clock, Joe, so I don't know if I talked for an hour or for two minutes. We, I hate that we stifled you from those three hours because that is just amazing, Dr. Allen. And we really want to have you uh, continue to be a part of OICA because the work that we've been doing over the last several years, so this certainly ties in with what lawmakers need to hear. I know what the different state agencies are sharing with their employees and trying to reach out to individuals. It's that awareness that's certainly going to help us. So with Oklahoma having the highest ACEs rate in the nation for multiple uh, different areas, it certainly ties in with what kids experience going into adulthood. And we have to instill that hope in those children so we can break that cycle. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And Dr. I mean, uh, Doris Francine, uh, my favorite retired judge up in Tulsa, certainly uh, wants us to share that PowerPoint. So if that's all right, please send that to me and we'll make sure that gets out to everyone. Absolutely happy to do that. And if you have any questions for Dr. Hellman, uh, please type them over in the chat section. And certainly I'm looking forward to us uh, having the opportunity to all be together soon and be able to discuss these things when it's not just over computer. Um, but I will say this has been fantastic so far. I really appreciate uh, everything that our speakers have put together. And as Dr. Hellman said, uh, we're leading into our final speaker, which uh, as a fanboy and it being NFL draft day, this is certainly uh, one of the highlights of my day. Uh, and it's our honor and pleasure to introduce uh, to this call Thurman Thomas. Uh, coming to Oklahoma State, from a storied high school career in Houston, Texas. He led the Big Eight in scoring and rushing twice from 1984 to 1987. Uh, Thurman carried the ball a remarkable 897 times for the Cowboys, the most rushing attempts in Oklahoma State history. Uh, going from OSU uh, to the pro side, he played for the Buffalo Bills for 13 seasons, leading them to four Super Bowls. Thomas is the only NFL player in the history of the league to lead the league in total yards from scrimmage for four consecutive seasons. He was elected to the Pro Hall of Fame in 2007 and has led a Hall of Fame life, dedicating himself to many causes and foundations, including fighting childhood obesity. Uh, he recently talked about his career in Buffalo on the Hall of Fame's Mission podcast, and we actually happened to have that and we wanted to play that before he gets to a speech so Lacey if you would cue that up well we like to welcome pro football hall of famer and buffalo bills legend thurman thomas to our live broadcast you know we talk about big games um and i don't know about you but i still get the chills when i hear you know whitney houston perform the national anthem <laughs> in the first super bowl and i wonder you know as you're sitting there on the sideline um you know, do you approach it like any other game day or does that experience really kind of envelop you at that moment, take over? It, it, it takes over. I'm not going to sit up here and say it was some any, it was some, any other football game. You can't say that. And we never got an opportunity to hold the Miss Lombardi Trophy, but I tell you what, it, it's a journey that I took with some very, very great guys. What was it like being coached by head coach Marv Levy? One of the things that we really did love about Marv is that, you know what, he treated us like men. Uh, we had to own up to our mistakes if we did have some mistakes on or off the field. He was a he was a great coach. He was a great father figure. He was a great leader. You know, we would love to know your favorite 
Buffalo Bills moment? My favorite Buffalo Bills moment um, would probably be the celebration with the fans after we beat the Raiders 51-3 to to go to our first Super Bowl. I mean, just going around town to the gas station, to the bars or whatever. I have never, ever seen anything like that before in my life. But like I told Sean McDermott, I'm looking for a bigger and better celebration. So as a diehard OSU fan and a graduate of Oklahoma State, it is my honor and privilege to welcome to this discussion NFL Hall of Famer Thurman Thomas. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I didn't realize you guys were going to have playing some, some things that I had uh, associated with the Hall of Fame, but thank you very much. Um, Good evening, everyone. Um, man, I wish we could be together. Uh, that would be so great. Uh, I've always enjoyed coming back to the great state of Oklahoma. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself that you might not know, but you might have heard. Uh, I grew up in Houston, Texas, uh, the son of a single mom. Uh, my father was very much in my life, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it was just myself and my mom. And quite often, it was just me sometimes because she had a full-time job. Um, I learned at a very young age responsibility and how to take care of things like myself and my home. Uh, I believe learning the responsibility at a young age was very beneficial to me throughout my football career and throughout life in uh, general. Uh, my parents always stressed the importance of a strong and healthy body and a strong and healthy mind. Uh, they made sure that I knew that I was eating healthy and staying active would not only allow me to achieve physical goals, but also help me stay mentally focused. Um, like others on this call, Charlotte, you did an absolutely great job. Uh, your message was very, very strong, uh, encouraging us to do more, to get youth, to be more engaged in outdoor activities. Charlotte, you are an inspiration and you have a bright future ahead of you as an advocate and as a leader. And you just heard not too long ago that Oklahoma State had our first female president at Oklahoma State. Can't, mem can't remember her name off the top of my head, but um, maybe that one day can be your job. Um, I actually didn't start playing football until the seventh grade. So I guess you can say that I was um, uh, a late bloomer. Um, I played baseball and I loved it. And um, I was kind of tricked into playing football uh, but I guess you can say that trick wasn't bad. It really did end up working out for me. Um, for me, staying active not only became a choice, it became a necessity if I was going to continue to compete at a higher and higher levels. I remember back then, kids were basically on their own when it came to getting physical activity and eating right. It wasn't that our caregivers and our school faculty didn't care about our health. It was because we didn't know the knowledge uh, the programs and excess information that we have today. Programs like Play 60 would make all the difference in the world for a ton of kids I knew growing up. A lot of these kids didn't have parents, coaches, teachers to encourage them, monitor their nutrition or their activity. Fortunately for me, I had a great uh, family support. My dad and my uncle really saw in me what, um, what a lot of other people, I guess, would see is that I had the ability not only to be a great football player, but I also had the ability to uh, bring people together. Um, for my high school career, I was the captain of the football team for four years in a row. And at Oklahoma State, I was a captain for three years in a row. And uh, so my leadership abilities were really taken over. And, and it really started when I was in high school because I knew a lot of kids you know, like I said, they didn't have parents, they didn't have the coaches, they didn't have that support system. And one guy in particular that became really my best friend throughout my high school, my college, uh, my professional career, and all the way to this day, he had six brothers. And I knew from the time when I saw him on days after school that he was looking drained and he was looking tired. And so what did I do? Being an only child, I knew that my family, my mom could really cook a meal. And so I invited that kid over to my house a number of times, not only for one year, but for four years that I was in high school. And it really meant the world to him. And uh, I just got a note from him about two weeks ago saying that 
we just had our fifth kid and all of them are boys. And I just remember how I felt back then when I didn't have a lot of stuff on the table to eat that you uh, brought me into your home and really and, and took care of me on some days and he really appreciate that and and now he's trying to do the same thing uh in texas and uh i really appreciate him he's been a been a great friend throughout um i was fortunate enough to earn all american honors at oklahoma state university and a candidate for the heisman trophy my senior year my professional career included 13 seasons being part of a team that went to four super bowl appearances unfortunately we didn't win anyone I know there might be some Cowboy fans on here, so just be quiet, don't talk about it. Uh, I was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2007 and the College Football Hall of Fame in 2008. Um, throughout my career, first as an Oklahoma State Cowboy, I know there's some Cowboy fans out there, and then as a Buffalo Bill. Uh, I was blessed to have some of the best trainers, nutritionists, and folks along to help me look after me. Truly, even the great support system and folks around me that cared, it was still a challenge to eat right and make good choices. I knew that I, if I had been had a difficult for me, someone that had the support system, can you imagine how difficult it must be for young people who don't have a support system? This is one of the reasons I became associated with the National Diary, Diary uh, Council, Dairy uh, Management Inc. and Play 60 which I have now been involved with for over 10 years. Um, in Buffalo, my wife and I started the Thurman Thomas Family Foundation, which not only provides college scholarships to students in need, but we do free football camps for the inner city youth. I will always make it a priority to do what I can to help my community. It is amazing to see some of these kids when they get off the buses and they actually see a real football field. Not to bring everyone down, but these kids, to see anything but a busy street in an unsafe, forgotten neighborhood park. The challenge is real, people. So the remedies have to be real. The remedies have to be un united and an organized effort. Each year, we're able to reach millions of kids through Place 60 events. There are over 500 schools enrolled in our program and more than 250 youth fitness zones that provides kids with access and resources to play. I speak to kids all over the state of New York on the importance of fitness and nutrition. I stress that you don't have to be an elite athlete to care about your physical fitness levels. We should all be concerned about that. Just take it a step further. We should be encouraging kids, encouraging friends to get outside, play, run, jump, just to be active no matter what their athletic prowess may be. Even one step further, it is very important that we make everyone feel welcome to join playtime and activity time. Those days of being the last kid picked on a team in PE need to be over once and for all, whether it be a school setting or not. No one should feel, no one should feel intimidated, inferior, or scared to join. Food insecurity is a real thing. We should all like to think that healthy food is accessible to all, but it's not. Have you ever heard someone say, well, that kid isn't missing any meals? This is such an insensitive and awful take on childhood obesity. Oftentimes, the reason kids are obese or overweight is because their food options are slim and unhealthy and because the opportunity for physical activity isn't available or isn't in a safe environment. There's another reason I take part in initiative like Place 60 and the nutrition programs they're associated with. These programs provide healthy food and nutrition to our underserved and often uninformed. They help provide safe environments for our youth to be active. In America, we are getting better, but we still aren't there yet. It is going to take all of us to care so that we can raise stronger generations. Every, everyone needs to do their part. The pandemic has been tough on everyone, especially children. They need us now as they start to get back to school and away from distance learning. They need advocates like all of you here tonight. I am proud to be here on behalf of the Pro Football Hall of Fame and the OICA. I love Oklahoma and all the little future Cowboys and I guess all the little Sooners also. I am thankful for all the folks here tonight 
that fight the good fight for the children of Oklahoma, especially ones that need us most. It doesn't take a, take a cape to be a hero to someone. It just really requires more than words. It requires action. Thank you all for having me here today. God bless Oklahoma. God bless the folks here today and their hard work. And God bless the children of Oklahoma. Thank you. Thurman, thank you so much. And I say, I was a high school student when I first saw you play, and that was one of the selling points for me to go to Oklahoma State. And so glad you are staying so active with this. Um, the work you're doing with the, your foundation with NFL Play 60, just the different work that you're doing. We need that inspiration. We need leaders like you out there. And we can't thank you enough for joining us today. I certainly wish it was in person. Right. I'm hoping someday we'll have that chance. Um, and just want to ask, we've got a lot of advocates out there and you've heard uh, some of the things that the Lieutenant right. Governor has mentioned. Um, what, do, what do you think we can do? I mean, obviously there are a lot of issues that, uh, that we need to focus on. Uh, it's the, the anniversary uh, or the, the hundred years since the race massacre. We've been trying to reach out to the different communities. I mean, you witnessed that yourself uh, growing up in Houston. Uh, what can we as advocates do to help break down some of those barriers and reach out to people? Well, I think one of the things that you must do is that you have to continue to reach out to those people. I mean, you can't stop. Uh, I think you have to go forward. You have to do whatever you possibly can to get people, because I know there are a lot of people out there that are really hesitant about getting involved in a lot of different things, but hey, you, we can only do so much and we can only say so much. And, uh, but those actions will speak louder when we continue to grow and we continue to get the word out. Uh, you know, I've, Oklahoma is like another home to me. I, I'm willing to do whatever we can and once we can all get together, uh, you know, I love to come back there and share my thoughts and share uh, and, and listen to what you guys are doing in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, like I said, it, it, it's home for me and uh, I'm willing to do whatever I can to help anybody. You know, that's one of the things that my mom taught me uh, growing up is that, you know, what she always talks about when we go places and stuff, like, you know, you should really be happy that people know your name. They know who you are. They know what you accomplished in life because she said one day it's going to be over. And I don't want you to be uh, one of those guys, one of those persons that leaves this face of the earth. And they said, well, he didn't do this. So he did, didn't do that. Well, my mom wants me to leave this earth as a guy who tried to do almost everything that he possibly could to help others, which is more, which is so much important to me. Well, I can attest to that. Uh, going beyond having your name on the, the ring up there in Stillwater, uh, just the legacy you've left so far has been tremendous. And we know you're living up to that expectation. We can't thank you enough for all you do. And and I'll just leave it. If you have any closing remarks, uh, uh, it's all yours. Thank you so much for being a part of this today. No, thank you. Uh, it's been great. Um, like I said, I'm I'm an OSU cowboy for life. Um, I really try to represent the school very, very well in every action and everything that I possibly do, but it's not just Oklahoma State University, it's the state of Oklahoma. And um, uh, I just really, really appreciate everyone, even after this call, just be thinking about the little ones, the children in, uh, in Oklahoma uh, that need us right now. And uh, hey, God bless. Um. We just had a comment over here in the chat section reminded me to uh, thank my board president for developing severe allergies where he couldn't talk today. Bruce uh, was supposed to introduce you today being my board president, but he couldn't talk. So I got that pleasure. So I'm thankful. I'm sorry for your, uh, your, your uh, allergies, Bruce. Uh, we're, I know we've got a lot of work to do and that's why we wanted to focus this conversation. Uh, we were thankful that this came up in a cabinet meeting with the city administration. We were thankful that Lieutenant Governor Pinnell has stepped forward to lead the charge on that with gathering the agencies and organizations together to focus on this. We're thankful Charlotte Anderson, uh, when she applied to be our kid governor, this was her topic and she's gonna lead the charge as our spokesperson from OICA and hopefully we will see her face out there. She wants to be a doctor someday. She's, she's smarter than AJ and I, she doesn't wanna go into politics. 
He wants to actually help people directly through healthcare. And so I have confidence we're going to see that. And I want to say thank you to everybody who joined in today. Um, we'll post over here in the link. If anybody wants to make a contribution uh, towards the effort, we certainly, as a nonprofit, don't turn those donations down. Uh, we've got a lot of things coming up. Uh, Miranda Hines, our program director, is on here. And I know we're going to plan uh, an outdoor activity with Charlotte this summer to uh, kick off more of the work that what she wants to do with her scavenger hunt and her bingo game and try and find ways to continue that work that we did from the Fit Kids Coalition from years ago and spin it forward into rebranding. The Lieutenant Governor is fantastic at rebranding things. We've seen that with here in Oklahoma and we'll see what happens as far as going forward with this initiative and under his leadership. Uh, we've got a lot of wonderful people out there like Chan Hellman who are putting the science and the data behind this conversation to help us make those arguments. And we've had a lot of good bills going through the Capitol. Uh, we've had uh, Danny Sterling filed a bill to increase uh, opportunities for physical education uh, checks and the schools. Uh, it was talked about Rhonda Baker's bill with improving the health qualities. I feel like we're on the right track and we've just got to keep doing those things that need to be done. And I want to go back and uh, thank all of our sponsors again, uh, uh, Oklahoma Complete Health, Clay. Uh, they helped arrange uh, for uh, Thurman to be our speaker today. Uh, Paycom uh, helped uh, fund a lot of the cost and was the primary sponsor for this. And then First United, the Journal Record, and our one of our board members, uh, Sharon Pyatt and her husband, Bill, were sponsors. Um, all of our board members help sponsor the different events throughout the year and spread that out. We thank all of our board members for being involved. And last but not least, as we close out, certainly want to go back and put that link in to the, uh, the chat uh, for any individuals who would like to make a donation. Uh, it helps us. We're a nonprofit. As I tell people, uh, I wish we were a charity, but we're a nonprofit. So we've got to raise money to cover those costs. And our Heroes Ball that's going to be in July, on July 30th, is going to have a special focus on wonderful advocates that are working here in Oklahoma to make a difference for kids. And we're going to have a discussion about uh, history and the teachings of what uh, we've heard and seen from the 1921 race massacre, um, the lack thereof, and what more needs to be done. That was a conversation that was happening in the House of Representatives this morning. Um, there is the link. Um, if anyone has any questions, now is the time to type them in or send us an email. And I just want to close out. We'll finish up a few minutes early. Once again, thanking Mr. Thurman Thomas for being a part of this. Um, it's great to meet you over the uh, over the Zoom and look forward to hopefully seeing you back here in Oklahoma because uh, we consider you an Oklahoman and we are so thankful that you are doing so many great things all across the United States and with the Hall of Fame and working with the great team on this topic of trying to improve kids' health and well-being and their lives. Thank you. So with that, I want to say uh, we've had a wonderful conversation. Again, we certainly wish we could have all been together, but we wanted to stay safe. Um, as Keith would say, please go get your vaccination. We have seen far too many Americans who have gotten the first shot and not followed up with that second shot. Uh, we are very thankful that we have this commercial running uh, with Miller from our family at OICA, encouraging Oklahomans to get the shot, wear their mask, and donate blood because we are facing a critical blood shortage uh, all across the United States right now. OICA will be doing a blood drive on May 13th uh, at Charleston's in Bricktown in partnership with Bricktown Rotary and the Oklahoma Blood Institute and several other partners. And so we're going to try and do what we can to step up and help out. Everyone, please be safe. Have a wonderful Thursday. and. With apologies to my center friends, go Pokes. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>